Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 1st of November and today we're doing a full front update. We're going to be going over events that have unfolded over the past five or so days and that's because I haven't been able to regularly update the situation on the ground so I apologize for that. But now we're going to be going over a pretty long summary so I won't be showing that many videos so I apologize for doing that but either way let's begin by looking at the Harrison front where over the past couple of days, Ukrainian DRGs and Marines have continued to fortify and supply their fort positions in Krinky and the nearby forested areas located to the north of Krinky. The Ukrainians have been able to establish a new supply line, which it starts on the southern bank of the Dnieper River, and it runs along the Konka River like this, and then it leads into the houses within Krinky itself. And that's part of how the Ukrainian forces located in Krinky have been able to receive resupply, rotate their forces, and move out dead or wounded troops. In this video, you could see that the Ukrainians are engaged in house-house combats. They're using small arms fire against the Russian forces that are trying to counterattack in this direction. And this is due to the fact that you had elements of Russia's 810th and their 26th Motor Rifle Regiment that organized forces in two different areas. One area is to the south of Krinky, within the forested area to the south of the village and in this open field located over here. And then another group of forces located in Korsunka. So they launched two different attacks from the west and from the south. And as a result, the Ukrainians were forced to go on the defensive and hold their positions. So far, there have not been any reported movements. So the Ukrainians have been able to hold on to their positions. And then in this video, you could see that the Ukrainians are shelling the Russian uh, grouping. You can't see anything specific, but it just shows the general Ukrainian shelling in the forested area to the south of Krinky, where you do have the buildup of Russian forces, mainly infantry, not as much armor. But in this video here, which is from the Birds of Magyar, which I can show on YouTube, Birds of Magyar, as you recall, it's one of these drone units, one of the oldest ones that Ukraine has had. They were moved into the Harrison sector, and they're supporting the Ukrainian forces that established the Krinky bridgehead. And in this video released by Birds of Magyar, they target various uh, Russian BTRs, vehicles, vans. There's some, uh, there's one tank actually, an ammo cache. So there's a lot of Russian armor, lighter armor, mostly around Korsunka, which is being gathered for their preparations for further counterattacks in the direction of Krinky. And then there's also just some sort of supplies and just regular Russian positions for infantry located over there that are being targeted by the Birds of Magyar drone group. But the Russians, of course, as we talked about before, are conducting their own strikes. Of course, with FPV drones, we've gone over that extensively, targeting Ukrainian positions mostly on the southern bank, but also on the northern bank with FPV drones. There's plenty of videos out there showing the Russian airstrikes onto Ukrainian staging points and warehouses. So staging points are very important because they want to preemptively destroy the Ukrainian forces before they cross over the river. And then there's also warehouses where they store all their supplies located within these villages that are very close to the Dnieper River. And here you can see just some of that footage of the destruction that's caused by the Russian airstrikes and shelling. And uh, this one is just in an area to the northeast of the Krinky Bridgehead. And here's another cool piece of footage with, where you could see the overhead view of the battles in Krinky. You could see the Russian strikes on the Ukrainian positions in the forested areas that we were talking about to the north of Krinky. We could also see the supply line that I was talking about, which is adjacent to the Konka River. And you could see here the Konka River and the supply line that the Ukrainians are utilizing. And that's the area that Russians are targeting specifically, including the areas where the Ukrainian Marines are landing with their speedboats. On October 29th, it became known based on Russian sources that Colonel General Oleg Makarevich, he has been relieved of his position as commander of the Dnieper group of forces. And he was removed due to various failures on this front, which really did become apparent once the Ukrainians were able to establish their multiple bridgeheads across the Dnieper River. So now he's being replaced by a commander, uh, the, the commander of Russia's airborne forces, Colonel General Mikhail Teplinsky. And he has experience in the wars in Transnistria, Chechnya, and he serves as the deputy commander of the joint grouping of forces of the Russian forces within Ukraine. So he's very experienced. And generally, from what I've seen from Russian sources, he is pretty well respected. So we'll have to see what he does differently compared to the previous leader of the Russian grouping in this area, which includes 
two lines of uh, rear units and then one line of frontline units, which I've outlined in an earlier video talking about the order of battle of Russian and Ukrainian forces on the Kherson front. After several failed attacks west of Robotinia, Ukrainian forces uh, in the Orkiv sector, mainly from the 33rd Mechanized Brigade, they regrouped following some of the losses of Leopard tanks and they launched a new assault around the 29th of October following a large artillery preparation on the fields and trenches to the west of Robotinia. So that would be located over here. And in their mechanized attacks on this region, they were able to take over some of these trench lines located over here specifically. And they were also able to get control of fields directly to the west of Robotinia, which relieved some of the pressure off of the uh, Ukrainians that are located within these trench systems located over here. And we've talked about this before, this trench system that I'm going over with the blue rectangle, it is a Ukrainian fourth position used to attack Nova Prokopivka, and it's being attacked by the Russian side. They're launching counterattacks from the western flank located over here. They're attacking in this direction. And the reason why the Ukrainians launched this counterattack to the west of Robotinia is in order to sort of relieve the pressure that was felt by the Ukrainian forces located in this area and repel the Russian counterattacks in this region. Another thing that the Ukrainians are trying to achieve in this region is secure the high ground to the west of Robotinia and to the east of Kopani, which is generally located in this area over here. So the Ukrainians, by taking over some of these open fields that I highlighted within the blue rectangle before, it means that they were able to establish control over certain pieces of higher elevation, although there's still a lot of higher elevated areas that are within Russia's red zone that's controlled over here. So the Ukrainian efforts on the Orkiv sector have basically all shifted in this direction to the west of Robotinia and the direction of Kopani more generally. Meanwhile, further east, the Ukrainians have moved in additional reinforcements from the 3rd Spartan National Guard Brigade to the front line in the area to the east of Novoprokopivka. And this unit is now going to work in tandem with elements of Ukraine's 46th Air Assault Brigade and their 71st Jaeger Brigade. Those are the elements that are fighting in these fields located over here. This is an area that's seen no progress by either side over the past month and a half where the Ukrainians have tried launching attacks multiple times but have really been unable to advance past the gray zone, which is a couple hundred meters separating between the Ukrainian positions in the areas, the fields east of Robotinia and the Russian prepared positions within the Surovikin line. In recent days, there have been a slight increase in videos released by the Ukrainian forces in this region targeting Russian forces and dugouts and targeting some of their vehicles located near the Surovikin line. But none of this is an actual serious attempt at trying to advance at all we have not seen any sort of movement really over the past month and a half as i said before so the front line on the orkiv sector is stagnant besides this one area moving on to the avdivka sector there are no reports of gains by either side around Develske or povermaiske nor around Vodiane. there were reports from both sides mentioning russian attacks on the main road attacking in the western direction but there were no additional updates about gains since the 24th of october when the russians were able to advance one kilometer to the west of the pond there was a reported russian attack on the 30th of october which led to a destroyed t-72 uh, the ukrainians destroyed it uh, they damaged a t-72 as well and damaged a bram one and this was on vodiana's main road then a bit to the east, I adjusted the map to show that the Russians have control of this specific field over here. They've had control over this one square kilometer area for a pretty long time, for a couple of weeks, but I just didn't update it, so now I'm doing it. Then moving a bit to the east, starting around the 20th of October, the Russian infantry launched attacks on Ukrainian fort positions, including trenches, and there may also be some underground systems in this region around the quarry specifically. And on the 29th of October, it was reported by Deep State and was confirmed via video footage, which shows the 53rd Ukrainian Brigade and their FPV hitting Russian infantry. It was confirmed that the Russians have control over the quarry, over the open fields in the area, over the uh, tree lines over there, over the local roads. So they were able to take over a pretty significant area on a local level on Avdivka's southern flank, and I'll explain why. Because as a result of their uh, advance in this region, which were at most a kilometer, but 
most cases it was a couple hundred meters in multiple directions they were able to relieve pressure off opitni directly from the north and were able to establish control over positions along this specific road which now gives them a new attack vector which of course would be very dangerous but nonetheless it is a new attack vector to advance along this road towards a supply line that leads into southern Akhvivka. this one over here that i'm going over in red Additionally, the Russians now have positions that are 1.2 kilometers away from this specific trench line. And this trench line is adjacent to the same supply line that I was just talking about. So not only could they try to cut off the supply line, but they could also try to take over the trench located over here, which is a very important trench because it defends the Chimik micro district within Evdivka. The Chimik micro district is located in southwestern Evdivka over here. I believe it's about two square kilometers in area over here you could see and it includes industrial facilities apartment buildings uh, agricultural facilities all of that so it's a very fortified area and the russians now have positions that are closer to its uh, last line of defense from the outside and supply lines so that's important and additionally it gives the russians an opportunity to try to flank and envelop put additional pressure on the flanks of this specific military base this abandoned military base that the ukrainians are using as a forward defensive node you could see how they're relatively isolated based on the map but nonetheless they are still able to hold out despite numerous russian assaults they've been able to hold on to this area there are a lot of trenches a lot of facilities there may be some underground systems that i'm not aware of but this russian attack from the west it might be able to put additional pressure onto the Ukraine forces located to the south of the Donetsk Ring Road. Now, looking at Avdivka's northern flank, it's been reported by Ukrainian sources and Russian sources alike that the Russians have been able, at the very least, to establish tenuous positions on the Terracon Slack Keep, and that the Ukrainians have fully withdrawn from the area to the east of the rail line, and they've regrouped around the Avdivka Coke plant located over here and around the village of Stepove. So the windbreaks that are parallel to the rail line, both of them are currently a gray zone. The Russians, they have more tenuous control over the slope, the slope facing downwards, uh, facing in the direction of Ukrainian controlled territory. That area is uh, less under their control. They have more solid positions on the slope that's facing in the Russian controlled direction. And they are trying to establish positions within some of the foxholes, some of the tunnel systems located within the Terracon but this has come at a cost here we have confirmation of the russians entering the top of the side keep then here we have a video from the 47th brigade unit that was fighting around orikiv sector but was moved to defend against the russian attacks on the northern flank and here they hit the russian forces on the terracon and then uh here there is photos of russian casualties on the slide keep i won't show that but it shows that they were able to reach pretty deep into the slide keep but the deeper that you go the farther away you are from the russian side and the closer you are to the ukrainian forces that are located within the uh, coke plant or closer to their drones so it is very dangerous and part of why it is difficult for the russians at the moment to launch further assaults further into the ukrainian lines specifically around the coke plant and the reason I mention this is because I saw yesterday on the 31st of October reports coming out from pro-Russia uh, Telegram sources that alleged the beginning of an assault on the coke plant. But this was quickly rebuffed by other Russian sources that were claiming that the Russians are still trying to regroup in this area, not just around the Terracon, but also in the fields to the north of it. For instance, these fields over here that are just to the west of Krasnohorovka, where the Russians for uh, weeks, many weeks, fought to solidify control over the trenches in this area. They're also trying to uh, solidify and regroup. They're not trying to cross over the rail line at the moment. They're just trying to keep control of what they currently have. And part of this is because launching further attacks at the moment when they're not fully solidified on their own lines could be very difficult and costly. And secondly, they are preparing for the Ukrainian counterattacks, which are already beginning to unfold, as we'll get into in a second. As an example of these Ukrainian reinforcements that were moved in from other parts of the front line that are now using Western weaponry on the northern flank of Avdivka, we have a piece of footage that was released by the 114th Brigade, the Russian side, and it circulated showing a Leopard 2A6 
and it was hit as it approached the rail line. It was damaged, but the crew was able to get out and survive. So that location of the Leopard is located over here. You can see how it was trying to approach an opening in the windbreak and trying to cross over the rail line, most likely in order to counterattack and push back the Russian fort positions near the other windbreak. And then the following day, there was footage released by the same unit, the 114th Brigade, and by the 14th Communist Artillery Brigade, and they filmed three Bradley Infantry fighting vehicles that were either damaged or disabled. And so the locations for those are here, here, and here. And again, you could see how they were trying to advance along uh, different roads, local roads, local paths in the direction of the rail line, trying to cross over and trying to repel the Russian forces that established new fort positions pretty close to the rail line itself. Now, while the Russian forces are focused on trying to repel Ukrainian attacks that are ongoing to the west of the rail line, there are also Ukrainian counterattacks ongoing to the north of Krasnohorovka, which could be even more dangerous. So, for instance, here we have a geolocated marker showing an attempted Ukrainian counterattack, and they were eventually shelled by the Russian side, by the Kuban artillerymen, but we don't know the results of that shelling. Either way, it does show us that the Ukrainian forces were present at this specific location, at this tree line, and it shows that they're advancing along these different tree lines adjacent to a highway that does run to the east of Krasnohorovka, and the Ukrainian objective in this region would be to degrade the Russian rear and degrade the Russian columns before they're even able to launch their attacks along the front line, and that's the rationale behind attacking from the back. Here you have an elevation map of the Avdivka sector, and here's a quick sketch of the front line. You can see that the Ukrainians have positions that are located on high ground to the east and to the west of Karamik. Karamik is located over here, and that's on rather low elevation. So more generally, the Ukrainians do have the high ground advantage in this region as they're overlooking a lot of Russia's positions that are located within Krasnohorovka, where a lot of their armor gathers before it launches attacks further west, and also on a lot of the supply lines that are leading into Krasnohorovka, for instance, all of this valley region located over here, all of that is on rather low elevation compared to the Ukrainian positions. And a lot of the high ground is located specifically on the rail line. And you can see how the rail line, uh, I'll mark it in blue, for instance, it's located over here. So parts of the rail line are under Russian control and parts are under Ukrainian control. A big focus for Russia could be in the coming days to solidify control over additional parts of the rail line in order to get control of additional pieces of high ground and it could also be an effort to repel Ukrainian attacks as the Ukrainians are already beginning to launch attacks from this direction specifically as we talked about and this is something that the Russians do have to keep in mind before they launch their own attacks further west in the direction of Stepove is that while they're launching those, those attacks their rear could be seriously threatened by Ukrainian forces that are located on higher elevated area firing onto their supply lines. Now looking at Bakhmut's southern flank on the 29th of October the Ukrainians they made some pretty minor gains in the area to the southeast of Andrivka, specifically taking over a new chunk of the rail line that runs to the, to the east of Andrivka. So in this area over here, the Ukrainians were able to make some gains, as was confirmed by this video showing Russian drones dropping munitions on Ukrainian infantry near, near the rail line as they were taking over this trench position located over here. There's some other videos from this region that I'll click on just to show you guys. There's a video here that's pretty old of a drone strike on a Russian ATGM on the rail line. There's a video over here from Russia's 128th Territorial Defense Regiment. And a drone strikes a Russian, or uh, previously Russian built, but now Ukrainian controlled ditch, which confirms the Ukrainian movement in that region. This is a video from, I believe, uh, a week ago. It shows the uh, 28th Brigade. Uh, this is the Ukrainian unit, and it's shelling the Russian positions in a forested area. And this is in the area that's the east of the rail line. By now, the Russians do not have any positions on the rail line anymore. Either they're a gray zone or they're just fully under Ukrainian control. And the areas where Russia does have control are in open fields, in forested areas, and in houses, in areas in and around Kordimivka. So if we go further south, the Russians, they have a pretty strong defensive node around Kordimivka, and they're trying to solidify their flanks because the Ukrainians are continuing to make very, very uh, small but steady gains to the north of Kordimivka in the direction of Zelenopilia. And so it is a, an important thing for Russia to strengthen their positions in the area located over here, just to the northeast of Zelenopilia specifically. At the same time, the Ukrainians are trying to put pressure on the Russian forces located within Kordimivka from multiple directions. As we talked about, they're doing it from the rail line, but also they're doing it 
from this area across the Donbass Canal, where there has been sustained fire from the 28th Brigade. The 28th Brigade is the unit that's hitting the Russian forces in Kordyumivka from the west. Meanwhile, the Liut National Police Brigade and the 3rd Assault Brigade are the ones that are attacking from the north, and that's in an effort to spread out the Russian forces. Nonetheless, the Russians do still hold on to the positions within the houses of Kordyumivka itself. Going further north, if we look at the Klishivka area, all of the fields that are to the west of the rail line that were previously a gray zone are now under Ukrainian control. The rail line in this region, including the windbreaks, are now under Ukrainian control. There is this geolocated video showing the Russians shelling the Ukrainians on the rail tracks and in the tunnels that are under the embankment. This shows us that the Ukrainians are now taking over the tunnels that Russia previously built under the embankment in this region and using it themselves, which could be used as a way to sort of hide from the FPV strikes that the Russians are utilizing in artillery, just as the Russians were able to hide from the Ukrainian side for many months using these same tunnels. But uh, despite that, there have been really no reports of additional movement past the rail line. So it seems like the Ukrainians are trying to dig in over here for the time being. And the unit that is doing a lot of these operations around Klishivka is the 80th Air Assault Brigade. Lastly, looking at the area to the west of Yahidnya, the Russians were able to storm a trench that was previously under Ukrainian control. If you remember, I made a video, I believe it was over a week ago, talking about how the Ukrainians repelled an assault onto the same trench. But it appears now that the Russians were able to regroup their forces, and this time they launched a uh, more so infantry-based assault, and they were able to overrun the Ukrainian defenses that were running along this specific tree line. And now it is under Russian control, which means that the Russians are about... Uh, about 500, 600 meters away from the Ukrainian-controlled village of Ivanivka. So there has been some renewed fighting in this general area to the east of Kupiansk. Then lo looking at the area a bit to the north, around the Persia Travnava area, there was also a pretty significant Russian assault, which is documented by the 14th Mechanized Brigade. They released some of the footage from that incident, which I have linked on my map. And what they claim occurred within this incident is that the Russians, they sent a pretty significant column, not just one, but multiple columns further south along these open fields. Some of the terrain over here is a bit rugged, but nonetheless, it is completely open. And most likely, this was being done in order to improve Russia's positions in the direction of the different fortifications that the Ukraine set up in the area that is to the east of Petropavlivka. Because the Ukrainian defenses in Petropavlivka, they expand all the way through this line over here, all the way to here. So this is most likely a Russian attempt at reaching and firing onto those areas and also as a more broad goal to reach the highway which connects the Ukrainian forces in Kupiansk to the ones in Ivanivka that we were talking about just a second ago. So they were able to advance through the open fields but were eventually spotted by Ukrainian artillery and they were also targeted with landmines that were laid in the area. So the Ukrainian claim is that they were able to destroy one tank and two BMPs and that three tanks and four BMPs were damaged throughout this entire incident. In the video they shared which I have linked on my map over here, you could see that there was destruction. I can't say whether it was damaged or destroyed but like we just call it losses because it includes both. So there were at least eight losses in the footage. So that means that there's a deficit of two. But yeah, that's all I have for today in terms of uh, Persia Travnave. Uh, one last thing is that there is a piece of footage over here. This was released by the Russian side and it shows a Russian T-80 and it's hitting the Ukrainian positions to the northeast of Sinkivka. And the area that gets hit by the Russian tank is located at this specific marker. And what this means is that over the past couple of months, at some point, the Ukrainians were able to reverse some of the Russian gains that were made to the east of Sinkivka. Because previously, the front line looked a bit like this, where the Ukrainians were in control of Sinkivka, but they did not have control of the fields or the road that is located to the east of it. But now, based off of this geolocated footage showing the Russians firing onto Ukrainian positions to the northeast of Sinkivka, we could say that the Ukrainians were able to push back the Russian assaults in this region. It was probably not recent, but it is still worth noting, as the Russians have been trying for a very long time and still continue to amass force in this region and launch attacks every now and then in the direction of Sinkivka. So this is the current front line for you guys. And that's all for I have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.